Hey guys, um, so a few weeks back we talked about the prodigal son, which demonstrated God's amazing love. Um, the father who represents God and throwing his arms around the, the prodigal son um, who had abandoned him, who had spit in his face, who, which represents all of us, of us Christians that have um, rejected God, but then come back to him. Um, and, uh, and that beautiful picture of him running as fast as he can, not caring what anybody thinks, but being willing to just come and, and just hug him and just throw this amazing party that he's back. Um, and we get that beautiful picture. But we can't have a truly loving God and not have a just God. Uh, the two have to, the two have to be, you know, come together. You can't be truly loving without being just. You can't not care about when, um, when you when you hurt somebody else or when someone else hurts you. God cares about what happened to George Floyd. God cares about justice. I mean, although we should all continually strive for justice, we will never find perfect justice till God sets up his kingdom on earth. God does care about when you are hurt by others. And when you hurt others with your sin, God can't just wink at it and say, oh, it's no big deal that you, that you uh, kidnapped that child and, and murdered that child. Oh, it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. And it's a big deal to God. And when anyone sins, it has to be punished. And just because you aren't seeing it punished right now doesn't mean that it hasn't been that someone is not getting punished for it you have to be punished or you can let Jesus take your punishment for you and that's that's why the cross of Jesus Christ is just it's so beautiful how God melds his grace and his justice. God gives us his grace by not making us have to get punished for our sin. But he gives his judgment on himself. He pours out his judgment on himself so that sin is still paid for. So that sin still is punished. And how those two things meet perfectly and beautifully in the cross of Jesus Christ. It's just so cool. It's just so beautiful. All we do, all we have to do is accept the fact that we need his grace and his payment for our sin on the cross. A good God has to punish someone. So in this passage, we see what happens to the person that never accepts Jesus' payment for their sin. Our passage today is Luke 16, starting in verse 19. Luke 16, starting in verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate, was a beggar named Lazarus who was covered with sores and he longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even dogs came in and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the 
tip of his finger in the cool water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime, you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from here to us. He answered, Then I beg you, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone goes from the dead to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. There is so much in these parables. You could study them your whole life and still have them impact and teach you new things. Um, that's one of the amazing things about parables. But one main point of this text is that heaven and hell are real. And just because life is good now doesn't mean you're good with God. Just because life is good now, you still could be going to hell. And just because life is bad now, you still could be going to heaven. Both rich and poor people will go to heaven, and both rich and poor people will go to hell. The only thing that determines your final destiny is, have you accepted Jesus' payment for your sin? Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all there is to it. Saying, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be in charge of my life. And I believe that you were raised from the dead. Because God raised you from the dead, and in the same way that you are raised, I will be raised from the dead when I die. We know um, probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish we have eternal life. That's it. Believing in Jesus. That's how you're saved. Simple as that. We see in Hebrews 9, 27, Just as people are destined to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. We will, this, is, this life is the only chance we have to accept Jesus' payment for our sin. This is our one life, our one chance. So it matters what you do with Jesus right now. The rich man didn't go to hell because he was rich. He didn't go to hell because he was unkind. He went to hell because he didn't know God and he was unwilling to repent. He was unwilling to say, I'm a sinner and I need God. He was so caught up in his money and his wealth and his parties and living it up that 
he didn't care about God. He didn't have anything to do with God. He didn't repent. Repentance is just saying, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus. I don't want to live this way anymore. And I want you to help me change. And this parable is not saying that you get into heaven with your good works. We know that that is not the case from Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We're, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. God's grace given to us, freely given as a gift. You can't earn your salvation. You can't get it by, you know, helping homeless people or elderly people or doing enough good deeds or giving money to the church. You can't earn it. You can't get it with your ethnicity. You know, the Jewish people of the day thought, hey, I'm a child of Abraham. That's why he said, hey, Father Abraham, you know, hey, I'm your son. Why am I not there? I should be there, right? Because you're my father. No, it doesn't. Your nationality doesn't get you anything. Being an American doesn't save, get you anything. Being rich or poor doesn't save you. The only thing that saves you is faith in Jesus. It can't be earned. It's a gift of God. But real faith in Jesus will be demonstrated by good works. We see that in James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs? What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, not accompanied by action, is dead. So basically, just to sum this up, you're not saved by good works, but the person that is saved should demonstrate good works. Good works will become the fruit of your life. They will be a natural occurrence. If you really believe that you need Jesus to be saved, then you're going to want people to know that they need Jesus to be saved. It's going to naturally happen. Uh, second, God gives us all mercy. Um, he's been giving us mercy for our whole lives. Um, we see this in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So, God's not slow um, in keeping his promises, in judging sin, and making this world right again. We all see that it needs to be fixed. We all see that this world is messed up with things like George Floyd. We see it's messed up. And God has promised to make it right. But he's not slow in keeping his promise of making the world right. He's being patient with us. He's not just killing us, us flicking our heads off or striking us with lightning, which is what we deserve. But he's giving us time to repent and come to him and be saved. Because he wants all of us to come to him. He wants all of us to be like the prodigal son running back to him. He wants all of us to accept his free gift of grace and the payment for our sin on the cross. God gives us mercy by not immediately killing us and sending us to hell for our sin. He gives us time to repent. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. 
Right now, he's giving the whole world time to repent, but he won't wait forever. And someday, the world will be judged. The whole world will be judged. And we see that also in the rest of the passage of 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So this whole world is going to get destroyed and judged. God's going to bring his people up to be with him and this whole world will get judged. And then he will recreate this amazing new heavens and new earth uh, where there will be righteousness, where people will act rightly and there will be no more pain and no more suffering and no more tears and no more George Floyd's getting murdered. No more of atrocities like that. No more sickness. No more death. That's just an amazing thing to think about. But this life is, is a, a blink of the eye, a snap of the fingers um, compared to eternity. You know, I, there's a passage that would say your life is a, is a blip on the timeline of eternity. We see that in, in James 4.13. James 4.13. Now listen, you who say, tomorrow, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or to that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Your life is a mist. It's, it's here and then it's gone. And what you do with Jesus determines how you spend eternity. How you spend um, your eternal life. So it's important that you accept Jesus now. You accept his payment for your sin on the cross. One of the saddest things to me about um, George Floyd is, you know, as I'm processing these things and working through what happened to him and, and his murder, is his name is on signs and billboards and, and bumper stickers. It's everywhere, you know, but it's now after he's dead but i started thinking about but before he died who really cared about him before he died who cared who cared about this guy at all probably very few people if more people cared about him before his death as jesus does including that police officer, he would still be alive. He was probably overlooked and ignored by a lot of people, just like Lazarus in the parable. A lot of people probably ignored him because they thought they were better than him, like the rich man. So who, who is the Lazarus in your life? Who is the person you overlook every day? The person you don't care about? That person that just bugs you, bugs you, that you don't like. And so you don't pray for, you don't reach out to. You try to not interact with. That's the person 
that you really need to be praying for, that you really need to be praying about how you can reach out to them, how you can care about them. So, in the rich man and Lazarus parable, um, the rich man did not get his request granted for Lazarus to be raised from the dead as a witness of the afterlife of heaven and hell. But um, in, in God's amazing wisdom, we do have the resurrection of Jesus, which is a historical fact, like George Washington or any other president. So that we can know that when Jesus talked about heaven and hell, his words are true. We do have somebody that raised from the dead for us to testify to us that Jesus raised from the dead. As he raised from the dead, he testifies that heaven and hell are real. And he testifies that his own words giving this parable are true. And the rich man's family didn't get warned by, by someone coming back from the dead. But we all have been warned in reading this parable. They didn't get wor warned in the parable, but we all get warned. This is our warning. And this is an important passage because I don't want anyone to go to hell. I want everyone to be in heaven. I don't want anyone to be tormented in this fire. Not even my worst enemy. So, I beg you, if you haven't accepted Jesus, then accept him right now. Accept him right now. Let him be the Lord of your life. Let him be in charge. He's a loving, kind God who cares about you. Just like in the parable of the prodigal son, wrapping his arms around you in his love, willing to humiliate himself on the cross, shame himself for you, for me, to show his, his great love for us. That is the kind of God that I'm asking you to accept as your Lord, your Savior, to be in charge of your life, to accept that free gift of salvation, his payment for you, so you don't have to go to this place of torment. Heaven and hell are real. I want everyone to be in heaven even my worst enemy. So for you, Christian, that's listening to this, love people enough to tell them about Jesus. Even if it means they ostracize you or make fun of you or snicker about you or shun you, be willing to love them enough to tell them about Jesus. And you may not have all the answers, and that's okay. None of us do. None of us have all the answers. But when they ask a question you don't have an answer to, you just tell them, I don't have the answer. Let me let me go to somebody that has studied that specifically. Somebody that's a little bit more learned than me in this area. You know? Bring them to a, a church that is Bible-believing and that believes that Jesus is the one way to salvation. And it's only through him that we can go to heaven. 
It's only through him that we have true life now and for eternity. As we see in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way. You can't, you can't get to heaven through Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism. It's only through Jesus. Even, even the rituals of Christianity won't save you. Baptism or communion, those don't save you either. It's only by accepting Jesus' payment for your sin. So if you take away one thing today for people that have already accepted Jesus, this is the one thing I want you to take away. Heaven and hell are real. So love people enough to share Jesus with them. Love them enough to be ostracized to share Jesus. Care about them enough that their eternal destiny matters more than them liking you or accepting you. And for someone that hasn't accepted Jesus, one thing I would like you to take away today, one thing is heaven and hell are real. And just because life is good now doesn't mean that you're good with God. Just because things seem fine now doesn't mean you're right with God. Just because you got a roof over your head and food to eat, to put it bluntly, doesn't mean that you're not going to hell. And this is a hard topic to address, but I love you enough to say if you haven't accepted Jesus, you will be in hell. And whether I want to believe that or you want to believe that or anyone else wants to believe that, it's a fact. Whether or not it's my, what I would like to be true doesn't shape whether or not it's true. It's true because it's true. And my wanting it to be true or false doesn't change it. So I beg you to accept Jesus. I beg you to accept him as your savior. And if you would like to do that right now, um, I, that would be awesome. Um, so I could just pray this, this prayer with me. Um, just repeat after me. Um, Heavenly Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner and I recognize that I need Jesus' payment for my sin on the cross. And I recognize that you raised from the dead and because you raised from the dead, I will raise from the dead. Thank you for the free gift of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be in charge of my life. I thank you for saving me from the consequences and the punishment of my sin. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer today, praise the Lord. I mean, <laughs> praise the Lord because that's just amazing. And um, tell somebody, somebody's been praying for you um, and tell them, you know, tell them you accept Jesus. Find that church 
that is Bible believing and that believes that Jesus is the one way to salvation, the only way to salvation, and um, that believes that Jesus is God. And get involved there and, um, and start letting them build you up in the Lord Jesus. Hey, thanks guys.